I want to begin by saying that the general theme of what I'm going to talk about is uh, reinventing India as leader in science and innovation. And when I say leader, I mean leader, not one of the leaders. When I say leader, I say number one, not number two. How do we become that? That is the theme. But considering the fact that uh, uh, I'm looking at the theme, which is more on health care and uh, more on uh, uh, life science, bioscience, I have actually decided to be more specific. And I would say reinventing healthcare, the role of affordable innovation. I like to call it innovation, Indian innovation. There is something special about India, by the way, the way we think, the way we do. So that is more going to be more specific. Now, I must do some admissions. The honest admission is the first. I'm not an expert in health and biomedical sciences. Each one of you in here know more than I do. So I'm daring in some sense of talking about that. And with giants like Dr. Ganga Khedkar in the audience, uh, you know, it requires some special guts to give a talk. So sir, please pardon me if I make some mistakes. Second is, I know something about innovation though. So what do you do? You play on the safe ground. You talk about things that you know. And therefore, talk is about role of innovation in reinventing healthcare. So now I'm on safe ground, right? Because that is something I know. So I'm drawing from my experience of CSI research. Uh, we had 40 laboratories. We had Central Drug Research Institute. Several institutes engaged uh, in drugs, therapeutics, uh, in diagnostics, uh, and so on and so forth. So I've drawn on that because I was DG of CSR for 11 and a half years, so I learned something. The second is also, there have been 16 Masirkar committees, by the way, so far, out of which some have been on public policies. Like 1998, uh, I chaired uh, two important committees. The first was uh, the one which recommended conversion of RECs, regional engineering colleges, into NITs. And I'm very happy to see the way NITs are moving. And some of the NITs today uh, are going ahead of IITs. In fact, that was the dream we had articulated, by the way. In the top 10, if you see, there are NITs appearing there, and some IITs appearing below. So that was that 1998 Mashilgar Committee report. And after that, of course, this R&D in pharma industry, I remember at that time, 150 crore from government to be given to private sector for doing research. You know, that was something new at that time. So that committee gave me some experience. Uh, we had this spurious drugs and overhauling of drug regulatory system committee, 2003, Mashilkar committee. And uh, this is still being talked about because some of these recommendations, Dr. Ganga Khedkar, as you remember, have not been uh, sort of implemented. But as far as the spurious part of it is concerned, the penalty being swift sure and severe, that particular part was actually implemented. And then this recombinant pharma sector, I chaired a committee, biosimilars we talk about, and we had great uh, people like uh, Kiran Muzumdar Shaw and others. And then reforming Hafkin Institute, uh, I was the chairman of the committee, so I saw the working of biomedical research. And last is uh, the global ones, like the International Commissions of UK Government, WHO, World Health Organization. In fact, uh, I learned quite a lot from here. This WHO Commission on Public Health, Innovation and IPR, uh, you can see in the middle, the former president of uh, uh, Switzerland, uh, Madame Ruth Dreyfus. So she was the chairperson and I was the vice chair of uh, this particular uh, uh, a committee, and the idea there was to see, uh, once again, how to make medicines available, affordable, accessible uh, to the world, and I remember going around the world, as a matter of fact, to Brazil, to US, to South Africa, to China, and so on and so forth. So I learned quite a lot uh, during that. I'm, I'm telling you about this 
about what has been my learning experience, so as to say. And this Public Health Innovation Intellectual Property Rights Report was accepted by WHO. Uh, and also, of course, this uh, UK Commission, and you can see the commissioners uh, here. Uh, I just want to begin by recounting uh, the recent HK Firodia Awards on Science and Technology. And I'm very proud to say, uh, you know, we talk about gender, this, that, and the other. I'm very happy that all the three awards went to women scientists today. I think that deserves an applause. <laughs> I've been uh, chairing this committee from, uh, for 25 years now. This is the first time we did it. Uh, and you can see the three stars here. Uh, you can see, for example, uh, Kiran Muzumdar Shaw here. Uh, the biotechnology queen of uh, India started with uh, something like 10,000 rupees in a garage. And I remember I was a member of the board of directors of TDICI, the first venture capital company of India. And uh, she started in a garage with 10,000 rupees and then later on became billionaires. I think she is a kind of a role model on showing the way from Saraswati to Lakshmi, if I may put it uh, this way. And uh, you can see here Tacey Thomas, uh, the missile uh, uh, woman of uh, India, uh, Agni. She's also called Agni Putri, by the way. I mean, and something that makes India proud. And then, of course, you have uh, uh, Gangandeep Kang. Uh, she is vaccine woman of India, rotavirus vaccine. And of course, there is something special about her. You know, after Nobel Prize, what is the highest honor that one uh, can think of, it is Fellowship of Royal Society, FRS, and U.S. National Academy of Science, these two. And she became a Fellow of Royal Society. In 360 years of Royal Society, this was the first Indian woman to be elected. <laughs> and. Uh, it's a phenomenal experience. You sign in the same book that Newton has signed. It is on page nine, by the way. You are allowed to see one scientist's uh, signature, by the way. And all of us see Newton. I, I did that in 1998, I remember. And that's such a special pleasure. So she uh, sort of had that honor, first woman. So these are the three women. And their inspiration, and uh, of course, I'll refer to Gagandip Kang's thoughts on biomedical science a little later. Now, I'm talking about affordable innovation. Very important for India. Very important for the world, as a matter of fact. And how do we do that is what I'm going to talk about. The first point I want to make is that when we talk about innovation, we think it is technology innovation. Yes, of course, technology innovation is important, but there is business model innovation. There is system delivery innovation. There is workflow innovation. There is process innovation. There is organizational innovation. And there is a policy innovation. So remember, you have to master all these and use appropriate combinations in order to sort of move forward. You can do a great technology innovation, but if you fail in the others, you will fail. And therefore, take an integral view of this, this is very important. Now, if you look at the Indian challenges during COVID-19 pandemic and innovation, one is proud. Why? We had a number of challenges. The first was limited availability of quality test kits. In fact, these were the headlines in April 3, 2020. India finds itself at the back of the line for virus test kits. We are queuing and we are at the end. Why? because state-run labs were operating at 36% capacity, private labs managed just an average of eight tests a day, and actually there was a newspaper report which said the priorities are going to countries where there is a major outbreak like Italy and Spain, US and UK, so all other international vendors are saying, I'm not sure how much I can allot to India. Can you imagine such a position? We are waiting at the end of the line, and then what happened? India ran out of time when test kits, Several targets missed, still no sign of rapid testing kits. April 16, India, several other nations received 40 coronavirus test kits from China. Dr. Ganga Kedkar, you will remember that. 
you were involved in the policy deeply, and states advised not to use rapid testing. This was the situation, all right? Very difficult one. And then we rose to the challenge, and I'm very proud to show again a woman scientist from Pune, all right? And this great lady started her work in January as soon as WHO released the genome sequence on 28th March, launched first made in India uh, kit, tested 1.2 million people in three months, three times reduction in price, 95% component source locally, and on 25 July launched first made in India antigen kit at such a such cost. We should be proud of Pune, of this great great Then, of course, uh, the central laboratories, uh, like CSI laboratories, creating the IGIB, created in the other paper COVID-19 could, could be a game changer, we said. CRISPR Cas9 in biology and paper strip chemistry. They partnered with uh, Tata Sons to create this. And then young people, Salsit, rapidly repurposes from TB to COVID-19 test. Actually, uh, uh, Swasa, I think that's a fantastic company, and you might hear a little more about it in a few days' time. Uh, Salsit used audiometric technology to detect respiratory illnesses via cuff sounds. All that you have to do is to cuff. That's it. And you know whether you have COVID or TB or uh, what infection you have. It's an incredible breakthrough, by the way. Young people from India developing it. I'm not talking about national labs. I'm not talking about, you know, it, that, that, that's the power of our young. You look at this identified asymptomatic cases based on cup sound signature, and cost is just five cents. So 1,000x increase in testing in just 60 days. That is how India changed. That is what we should be proud about, all right? And the second challenge was how to screen the higher risk candidates, first in the given population, how to identify future hotspots before they reach that stage. And this was the challenge we had, right? Asia's biggest slum, social distancing. Can you do social distancing in a slum? When in that area there are 10 people, you can't. So what a fantastic challenge we had. And while coronavirus spread in the US, an Indian slum with one million residents contained it, Los Angeles Times says. Again, something we should be proud of. And Dharavi miracle proved simple basics, testing, tracing, and isolation. And if you see, this is very important. World Bank praises efforts to arrest COVID-19 spread in Mumbai's uh, Dharavi. And you can see the way different organizations uh, came together to actually make it uh, uh, happen, including the cure.ai technology. And this detects COVID-19 lung infections in less than one minute at dollar two. And this uh, helped in triaging the high-risk patients in Dharavi, you know. And the COVID-19 bus that conducted the mass uh, uh, screening, the rest is history. And it went global, by the way. That startup went global partnered with uh, Italy's San Rafael Hospital, uh, NHS uh, Bolton, NHS Foundation Trust, uh, and you can see the way it spread. I think when our Honorable Prime Minister says, make in India for the world, these young people are doing that, make in India for the world, all over Europe, so as to say. Again, a matter of pride. What was our challenge three? Limited ICU beds and skilled caregivers. All right, and here is a very interesting uh, news item that you read in Los Angeles. The situation here is dire. Every minute, 10 people test positive. Every eight minutes, someone dies. Ambulance circle for hours. Uh, hospitals are running out of oxygen, ICU capacity, people lying in hallways and tents. You would have thought that this is something in India. Sorry, it was happening in Los Angeles. People were dying in ambulances because ICU capacity was uh, a big challenge. And of course, Delhi had this problem. Who came to rescue? Mudit Dandavate, Gaurav Pachani, they created what is called as a dozy. And I will talk to you a little later about Anjani Mashalka Inclusive Innovation Award. And the way it worked is a continuous contact-free wireless monitor with remote monitoring uh, capacity. Just place under the mattress, connect to Wi-Fi, and sleep. And Seven parameters are monitored with 98.4% medical accuracy. All right, that's what they did. And you can, good. 
You know, I'll, I'll tell you something. Claps and a smile, they don't cost anything. So when you do that, give it in abundance, all right? So this is how actually it works and uh, you can see 6,600 blades were upgraded in 323 hospitals in 14 states and you can see its benefits because uh, uh, for, for example, uh, if you see the significant nurses hours that were saved, for example, 50 minutes per patient per day to 10 minutes, you can see the five times more efficiency and a nurse can monitor 10 times more people on their monitor than uh, sort of that she would normally do. And I'm very happy this is going global. Dr. Ganga Kharka, uh, CDC uh, has ordered now 5,000, UK has ordered 5,000 uh, of these doses and that is growing global. And this is expanding uh, like anything. Private hospitals now are using it because it's very easy to monitor, you know. The nurse doesn't have to come and wake you up every four hours and then, uh, you know, do whatever. Uh, anybody who has hospitalized will really, this is all monitored uh, basically remotely and that's something fantastic. It is our innovation, our young person doing that. Our challenge for you was low cost, high performance ventilators under Indian conditions. And this is this uh, Marico Innovation Foundation, I've been chairing it for 18 years. And uh, Harsh Mariwala has been responsible uh, for, for setting it up. And what we did was uh, we set up that Innovate to Beat COVID uh, uh, sort of a grand challenge, uh, Chandra Foundation and Marico Foundation. Uh, India needed not just innovation, but extremely affordable innovation. Now you will understand why I'm saying innovation. Because Indian conditions are different. No compressed medical air, frequent power cuts, not trained technical staff. That is not developed countries, that is India. And now you have to develop equipment that will work here. That is something special. And that challenge was taken. And I'm very happy to see this uh, Nokak uh, came up as an ICU ventilator, uh, Shreyas ventilator with automatic ventilation mode, and KPIT from Pune, lightweight ergonomically tested uh, uh, device. And this was all done within just a couple of months. That is the power. Whenever we are challenged, Basically, we do things. I see no reason why we are not permanently challenged, so that we'll do something <laughs> permanently, right? So applicability, ambulance to ICU, that, this was what was done. Uh, the other one was, of course, uh, how to meet an exponential rise in PPE's demand. And 50,000 PPE kits were imported every year, mainly from China. And from there, we actually uh, started exporting from importing country to exporting country. And that's what also India could do, all right? So India transitioned from importing to exporting country, exported 2.3 million kits in July. What are the challenge seven? No vaccines. India, a global leader in vaccines production, of course. And we were getting ready by repurposing existing capacity. And once again, if you see, uh, the world's best hope for enough COVID-19 uh, vaccine comes from India, Serum Institute. I'm sorry, I'm coming back to Pune again, but it happened in Pune. Pune is a happening city. And uh, of course, uh, you know uh, Serum Institute's uh, sort of capacity. But I want to highlight Bharat Biotech because this was a indigenously developed vaccine, uh, not manufactured based on licenses uh, from outside uh, uh, technology. And you could see India crossed 200 crore COVID jabs in 18 months on July 18, 2022. Would not have been possible if uh, uh, this sort of production was not there. So I think the main point by taking you through this is to give you a confidence. Give you a confidence that if we have talent, if we have technology, if we have trust, and if we work as a team, we can do it. And COVID has actually tested us out, and we have done it. I think a big round of applause for that. So now I come to the total innovation part and take you through what are the other 
types of innovations we can do. One is uh, making high technology work for rich, very easy. Second is making low technology work for poor, very easy. But making high technology work for poor, very difficult. Do you agree? In India, what we have to do? We have to make high technology work for the poor, affordable excellence, so as to say. So innovation is all about affordable excellence, and that is my theme. In my mother's name, I created this Anjani Mahashilkar Inclusive Innovation Award, which is powered by affordable excellence. And this award is given not to best practice. It is given to next practice. When somebody proudly says, I'm following the best practice, Are you are a follower. When you say, I have created the next practice, you are the leader. And that next practice becomes best practice for others. All right? This award has been going on for, now this is the 12th year, Sushil? 12th year. And you will hear the announcement on 17 November, that's the day my mother left us. Uh, that award is given on 17 November, you will hear the new award. But for 11 years that we have had, in Civil Society magazine, there is a cover story on this now. Those of you who are interested can read there. I will just cover a few, just to show that we can actually do it. These have been the awardees uh, so far, and 2022 will appear on 17 November here. And this, uh, for example, in 2020, we gave it uh, in non-COVID strategy to Senthil and Dinesh. And what they did was looking at pregnant women in remote villages, all right? Because they created what is called a Save Mom, an IoT-based material healthcare solution that monitors mother's health using smart wearables, thousand days care to mother and child for rupees thousand, so one rupee per day, making high technology work for the poor, all right? And it has gone to 100 plus villages, covered and benefited 2,000 plus pregnant women, and now states are coming forward. For example, Andhra Pradesh, practically every pregnant woman in uh, sort of a village will have that particular uh, benefit. You can see the kind of a difference. And it has made tremendous impact, by the way, uh, in wherever it has been actually used. Then this Dr. Vinay Kumar from Anupat, for example, eight test results within 60 seconds, no special storage conditions, very low cost. And uh, you can see Tata Trust helped us uh, help them to sort of take it around uh, the country. Look at Dr. Navin Khanna for dengue test. Uh, what he did was remarkable. Detect dengue in 15 minutes, not in one or two days. I hope none of you have had dengue, but if you have had, you know the challenge that you have uh, in terms of not knowing. And it became sort of a market leader in the country, cost around four times less and so on. There's an interesting story I want to mention, Dr. Ganga Kerkar here. I always talk about talent, technology, and trust. The trust part of it, I'll illustrate here. Dada, when he created this, like you say, 15 minutes, affordable, he had got US FDA, US patents, everything. You know what was his market share? Zero percent. Why? We were importing. From where? From Australia, from South Africa, and from US. Pandemic came. As soon as pandemic came, everybody started running around. Where are the kids? Kids were getting exhausted. So what do we do? We go begging. We went to these countries. Within one month, we wanted a massive uh, number of test kits. Two other countries said, no, we can't. Only one country said we can, South Africa. Uh, 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 sorry, South Korea. As luck would have it, they loaded the kids on a wrong ship which went to Africa. So we had no kids. So what do we do? There's no option. They went to his kids. His market share, which was 0% then, is today 80%. Now you see the good news and the bad news. Good news is our indigenous technology has 80% market share. The bad news is 
If the ship had come, he would still be 0%. At that part, the trust part. You know, there is a famous cartoon by R.K. Lakshman, where uh, an eye doctor is examining a patient. And he says, sir, there is a particle in your eye. Should I take out, take it out? No, I'm asking because it's a foreign particle. <laughs> I think that's the mindset we need to change. Let's trust our young people and they will deliver. That is the important message I want to convey. Anjani Mashilkar, Mihir Shah, for example, eye braced, you know, dollar one based uh, for screening. An amazing technology, ultra portable, accurate, minimal training, wireless, cloud connected, instant results, just for one dollar. And does away uh, with uh, all the painful, uh, you know, processes that you have to use. You don't have to do that uh, uh, at all, so as to say, biopsy and mammography and so on and so forth. And I'm very proud to say that it is spreading all across 25 countries uh, with a partnership with uh, G Life uh, uh, Sciences Saving Movement. Because it is non-invasive, you just move it around the breast and within no time you come to know what's basically happening. Uh, Raul Rastogi for Sanket ECG device, you know, like I say, best practice to next practice. This is the best practice, isn't it? If you want to take ECG, you'll go lie down and so on and so forth. What is the best practice? Don't do that. There's a device like this, half this size. I, I wish I had brought it here. I, I should always carry it whenever I'm giving these lectures. All that you do is that device, you put your two thumbs for 15 seconds, and there is a sensor here. This is your heart, 15, 15, 15 seconds, 15, 15, 15 seconds. And if you have downloaded an app called Sanket, your ECG comes to you, you know? And it's an incredible technology. You can see the demonstration of what I just now said. And this was what he did, Sanket 1.0, which was just a six lead at that time. But we converted it into a portable 12 lead ECG event monitor. And this is how it looks now, capable of giving 12 lead medical grade ECG. Two lakh devices have been sold in eight countries. Once again, made in India for the rest of the world. I think this is the important part. Then this uh, Leo Mauli for XVR state, that was another Anjani Marshall conclusion. See, this is an advanced wound racing that stops traumatic external bleeding instantly, practically. Around 40% of road accident deaths result from bleeding, and there are 1.5 lakh road accidents. So what he developed was something that completely stopped bleeding in just two minutes. It utilizes some unique biomaterial that he has created, and today, it has gone to 40 plus countries, by the way. This is absolutely incredible. And Sushil, if I remember correctly, it was because his friend and he were traveling, the friend met with an accident, he was bleeding, and by the time he took him to the hospital, he bled himself to death. Most of the innovators that you see here have had personal experiences, by the way. That's why I always say innovation, compassion, and passion. Three things are important, all right? So these are all compassionate innovations. These are all innovators who are young. These are all innovators who are not trying to become unicorns, but these are all innovators who are trying to make a difference to the poorest of the poor by doing affordable excellence. These are role models, according to me. Then, of course, Mishkin Ingawale, Touch HB. Again, not best practice, next practice. You want to find out what your hemoglobin levels are. Best practice is, of course, somebody will come, prick you, take your blood, send it to the lab, and after three, four hours, you will come to know. No. Non invasive, no needles, not 150 rupees, just 10 rupees. And this is what he created Touch 1 HB using high technology photoplethosmography, spectrophotometry, and so on and so forth. That's what I said. Making high technology work for the rich, very easy. Making high technology work for the poor, very difficult. This is high technology working for the poor. And then I said best practice to next practice. See, he created the best uh, the sort of next practice here, right? But he was not satisfied because somebody will come and go forward. 
So he created the next one, which is a remarkable breakthrough. Captures the picture of conjunctiva and uses the method of reflectance photometry to estimate hemoglobin content in the blood. Can you just imagine, when you consider rural health, you don't have somebody to prick, you don't have somebody to send the sample, you don't have uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, laboratories and so on and so forth. Are nothing, don't bother. All that you do is push such cameras. The woman comes, looks into it, and gets the reading. This is transformative. These are the kinds of technologies that we actually need, but also the spirit. He displaced his own technology with the new technology, all right? And millions of uh, 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 customers are benefiting from that. I come back to the total uh, innovation and talk about workflow innovation. In healthcare, you have to realize that that can also make a difference. And the best example is Arvind Eye Care, because uh, you can see uh, the UK, US average for uh, cataract surgery is 1,000 to 3,000. You can do it in uh, 40 to 50 dollar. And uh, uh, you can see it is uh, making a dent in blindness uh, based on the kind of data that you see. But it is actually a workflow innovation, by the way. Because there are a series of steps that are required in cataract surgery, and the most difficult and most intricate where you require a real expert is the one who actually uh, does this thing. So the workflow is done in such a way that the costs are dramatically uh, reduced on the way, you know? And the idea was like a McDonald's, uh, I mean, he picked up the idea from McDonald, as a matter of fact. As you know, the kind of assembly line approach that one uh, picks. So innovation is something very interesting. Completely unrelated areas you can connect together. Like, for example, Ford Motors. How did the assembly line approach come there? You know, he had gone to slaughterhouse and saw the slaughter, once the animal is cut, for example, the part that is distributed, how in an assembly line they move. And that moved to food manufacturing, all right? Now in auto, I mean, if somebody had said auto manufacturing and slaughterhouse, you would not have connected, but see the breakthrough. So that is why I tell young people, lateral thinking is very important. In fact, uh, I'm bringing out a book uh, along with my uh, very young uh, uh, sort of uh, co-worker. Uh, you know him, uh, actually, uh, Harsh. He also had uh, come to this particular campus. That book is called Experiment. That is not just improvement, exponential improvement by what you call as uh, converging the parallels. That's a contradiction because parallel lines don't converge. Like Slaughterhouse and this, they are parallel, but we convert and create something new. So we are writing a book, it will come out in uh, from, from uh, Penguin. I mentioned this because he was connected uh, uh, with us. And you can see the workflow innovation, cardiac care, uh, the kind of difference uh, it actually is making. Then let us move on to process innovation, open source, for example. Now, open source drug discovery, OSDD, actually we had recommended this in our WHO Commission report because we are seeing how to bring down the cost. And I remember suggesting at uh, that time, open source exists in software, why not in drug development? So we had put it, but we did not know how to do it. And it was an Indian genius, Samir Brahmachari, who thought of how to get it. So CSR project on paradigm shift, uh, science 2.0, collaborative research, uh, collaborative systems level annotation, and uh, connectivity on the national knowledge network is what he did and created a semantic web portal developed by Infosys. Can you just imagine, he was able to get 130 countries and 8,000 people together. Can you just imagine when we talk about partnerships, we talk about two institutions, three institutions, 10 institutions. Can you just imagine 130 countries partnering together? And this is how uh, they uh, actually came, the kind of partnerships we had. What is most refreshing there, Dr. Ganga Kerker, is that 40% of them were students. Who would have thought that students can partner in drug discovery? But it actually happened. 
And the important point was that there was a novel combination reason, the first breakthrough, PA824 and uh, uh, poxiflaxacin and uh, uh, pyrazinamide for MDR-TB patients and promise of a simpler, shorter dressing and seem to have sterilizing activity in human pulmonary TB. And this is undergoing trials now and this received accolades from all around the world. I want India to be the first to think of something. OSDD, we were the first. You'll often hear the word first from my side. I said, I like to be first, not second. This was one where we took actually a lead. Then, of course, technologies are moving. AI adoption is reducing time and cost of drug discovery and development, as we all know. And after the pandemic, we have a new word, of course. And this is something we always show with pride, because vaccines, which used to take 10 years, we could do it under these challenging conditions in less than a year. As a matter of fact, you can see uh, COVID-19 illness was documented. January 10, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was sequenced. And uh, uh, on uh, December uh, 10, the FDA external review uh, was actually taken. This is one of the fastest. And under these conditions of adversity, when we have performed something like this, I think we must take that opportunity to look at how this can be used sort of in other cases uh, also. Now, post-pandemic, we have seen unprecedented uh, speed, scales, and uh, scope. Uh, science as a savior, I think when people talk about 2020, as a year of pandemic, I talk about it as a year of science. And particularly, I'm proud to have demonstrated a uh, year of Indian science, so as to say, all right? Look at uh, the telemedicine that grew 38 times in just one year. Microsoft says two years of digital transformation in two months. Coursera online courses, you have seen the way it has spread, the e-commerce sector, and so on and so forth. So the point I'm trying to make is that when you look at healthcare, there is what is called as the digital healthcare, the interface between healthcare and the digital world, which is going to be transformational, absolutely transformational. Uh, in the total innovation part, let us look at also the system delivery innovation. Uh, telemedicine, as somebody had said, 10 years of change in one week, uh, and it is also booming in India. Uh, in March 2022, India made important landmark in digital health journey, 170,000 teleconsultations in a single day. And healthcare in post-COVID world, extending care beyond hospital walls is a top priority for healthcare leaders now. We have to now revisit the way, uh, welcome, you came in just in time. Uh, extending care beyond hospital walls is a top priority for health worker. Actually, 40% of hospitals are expected to have shifted 20% of their beds to the patient's home by 2025. All right, that is the major change, by the way. And that is where dozy like innovation matters. All right, because when you shift to home, you have to do that monitoring and remote monitoring and so on and so forth. Uh, I want to come to the last part of my lecture. And that has nothing to do with now technology and innovation and so on and so forth. I suggest that we have a change in our mindset. I suggest that we start doing things differently. And what is that? That is reflected in this slide. This slide, General Bipin Rawat, unfortunately he is no more, he was Chief of Defense Staff, read our book, Leapfrogging to Pole Vaulting, that uh, I and Ravi Pandit had co-authored. And he gave an interview in which he talked about time has come to move from leapfrogging to pole vaulting. So you say, what is this leapfrogging to pole vaulting, which General Rawat is saying that India should stop leapfrogging and start pole vaulting. So let me take you through that, because that's a personal journey. It all began with uh, Mukesh uh, Ambani and my uh, conversation, the origin of the idea. I've been the chair of uh, the Reliance Innovation Council for a number of years. Uh, it had John Mary Lane, the Nobel Laureate. It had Bob Grubbs from Caltech, the Nobel Laureate. It had George Whitesides, the highest cited scientist in the world. 
but market cap of 30 billion dollars, Saraswati and Lakshmi, you know, kind of a record. It had C.K. Prahlad, no more, then Gary Hamel actually came over. Many of you would have known Bill Asseltine, Human Genome Science, he was a member. So we always used to talk about uh, the first principles. The first principle was for Reliance, growth is life, and you can see how it has exponentially grown. But then we said, innovation has to be a way of, way of life. So if you combine the two, it becomes innovation-led growth. But Reliance does not believe in just growth. It believes in exponential growth. Now, can you have incremental innovation and exponential growth? No. You have to have game-changing, disruptive innovation. And that's what they have been trying to actually do. And we are talking, and then Mukesh uh, suddenly mentioned to me, he said, Doc, uh, I think we must leave frog. So I said, hold on. Why does the frog leap, you think? She said, I don't know. I said, I'll tell you. The scientists' uh, studies have shown that he leaps because he's afraid of the predator. And he jumps a few feet. And again, as a reaction, jumps a few feet. Should we be doing that because we are afraid of our competitor and jump a few feet to protect ourselves? Or should we pole vault? The size of the pole determines the size of our aspiration. All right? He loved it. And Sushil is here, who heads uh, the Reliance Innovation Leadership Center. Under his leadership, we created this program called Beyonders. What is Beyonders? ability to think beyond the reams of possibility. We just picked up 30 odd people from 350,000, young people who are capable of doing that. All right? And what is their job description? Making impossible possible. You understand? Sort of the change of sort of mindset. And actually, it did happen, leapfrogging to pole vaulting. We wrote that book, leapfrogging to pole vaulting, and it won also the Best uh, Business Book of the Year Award. And I understand this year it has become a national best bestseller and they're bringing out the next uh, edition. And you can see here the pole vault. India pole vaulted from number 156 position to number one position in mobile data usage in February 17. How was it possible? And we have remained number one. Point is, we did not leapfrog from 156 to 150 or 100. We pole vaulted to number one. And we have remained number one. All right? Now, here, the important part is that if you look at the pole vaulting to reach 50 million users, telephone took 50 years, mobile 12, YouTube 4, Facebook 3, Twitter 2. And there were stories were written on how this fit. I think that story has to be rewritten now because Reliance Geo did it in 83 days. You would say, oh my God, if you have deep pockets, you can do that. No, you can't. There is a huge amount of innovation and that we have covered in our book. I won't have time to sort of talk to you about. I'm talking to you about a new spirit of pole vaulting. And India has been pole vaulting in the last decade. World's fastest and largest financial inclusion through JAM, Jantan Yojana, and Aadhaar and mobile, right? And it has got Guinness Book of Record uh, certificate. World's fastest and largest jump in mobile data consumption, as I showed. World's fastest and largest digital payment, UPI, for example. We are way ahead of the rest of the world. Ahead of China, ahead of US, ahead of everyone. And done so fast. You look at, uh, uh, for example, world's fastest and largest deployment of LEDs, light emitting diodes, you know? who create very little carbon footprint. So for climate change, it is very important. And we did it in record time, 0.2% to 88% in just seven years. What was the innovation? Demand aggregation, bringing the cost down of a nine watt lamp from $7 to $1, and creating system delivery and other innovations by which we could make it possible. India could do it. It's a world record. Similarly, you can see as India accelerates from a starting up nation to a leading startup nation. For example, if you just see, India produced more unicorn startups in 2021 than all previous years put together. This is incredible. 
यूनिकॉर्न फॉर दोज हु डोंट नो यूनिकॉर्न इज वन बिलियन डॉलर मार्केट कैप हंड्रेड करोड़ और राइट कैन यू जस्ट सी दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट नाउ दैट टिल सिक्सटीन सेवनटीन अप्रॉक्सिमेटली वन यूनिकॉर्न वॉज बींग एडेड एवरी ईयर इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन इट एडेड फोर्टी टू यूनिकॉर्नस सो मूविंग फ्रॉम वन यूनिकॉर्न अ ईयर टू ऑलमोस्ट वन यूनिकॉर्न अ वीक I think we should be proud. We should be happy. But we should be more happy. And now I will demand an applause. That 50% plus unicorns from tier two, tier three, and some dropouts. <laughs> This is an applause on demand for a simple reason. That just look at Pune, from Shivapur, from Khed, from Satari, Satara, from Sangli, a farmer's son. 26, 27 year old, who doesn't see any future for him, suddenly becomes a unicorn, 100 crore market cap, democratization of wealth, so as to say. All right, that is the new India. That is the new India that we are talking about. And then the question would be, and somebody asked me this uh, when I was writing the book. We were writing the book. Arey Baba, you are pole vaulting. How do you make sure that uh, your back is not broken? and that chapter 3 describes how you should do that this is called assured innovation framework these are the characteristics of innovation that you must meet healthcare or otherwise affordable scalable sustainable universal resilient excellence in terms of technology and distinctive not me too not me too all right you have to compare with your competitors and see how you are distinctive you must have intellectual property rights protection you must have strong patents for example which distinguish you from uh, sort of uh, the others and these are all criteria that are actually quantitative semi quantitative not just qualitative and they are being now used very widely in fact our book actually shows that these are all companies which are very successful and they don't exist anymore so once assured not always assured just take two examples Napster, free download of music. They had 80 million customers. Today they don't exist. Why? Because in the sustainability part, there are four aspects. The first is the one dealing with economics, business model, not dependent upon subsidies. Government change, subsidy change, then you are gone. So don't depend on the government any time. Do it on your own. also society must accept it so society of musicians said you can't download my music free khatam and they collapsed assured that s vanished look at blackberry at one time i think young kids will not know even about blackberry all of us knew but what went wrong with blackberry as you can see they did not remain distinctive because they were still an email machine based uh, on uh, you know punching something on the keyboard whereas we had touch technologies android and whole range of things they did not move on that and they were lost out from 60 million they came to zero so the main point i'm trying to make is that this particular framework is a very powerful framework people look at trl technology readiness level 1 to 9 but that is technology readiness for the current business today's business what we have to see will you be surviving after 5 years all right and that's why you can see that for example jio is it affordable yes 4 rupees per gb voice free certainly affordable is it scalable yes it has half a billion customers today is it sustainable yes it is making profits is it universal yes you can see these two ladies nothing common between them but both of them are using it is it rapid yes you saw in 83 days 50 million customers is it excellence in terms of technology yes when the country was hovering around 2g 3g they gave 4g lte now of course we talk about 5g and was it distinctive yes there are so many features on that so that is the issue of framework on the other hand you look at even a great company like google can fail because they fail the issue of framework for example they were distinctive and excellent but uh, they uh, did not remain scalable sustainable universal for a simple reason that you are wearing a google glass 
When you are, I'm talking to you, you don't know whether I'm downloading what you are saying. I'm entering a theater, you don't know whether I'm downloading the movie, and so on and so forth. So it vanished. So this Assured Framework has become very popular. I started using it when our Honorable Prime Minister created this uh, uh, Swajh Bharat, and then I chaired the committee to select the technologies on uh, uh, sanitation and drinking water, and we wanted uh, the very best technologies, and we started using that Assured. And that ministry adopted that, and even if you go today, you have to fill up that Assured Framework, by the way. And there are numbers, actually. When you say affordable, you actually put numbers. When you say distinctive, you have to actually compare, and so on and so forth. And then it has spread quite a bit, and Vidya, I suggest, and Raju, I suggest, that in symbiosis, we should start using this particular framework for selecting technologies and in a uh, variety of things. Uh, startups are using it now for doing SWOT analysis. Small, medium enterprises are using it. Corporates, our own TCS is using it now. Investors are using it as a funding decision tool. Innovation accelerators are using it, uh, like GeoGen Next and others. Government agencies are using it, industry associations. In fact, there's an award from Bombay Management Association called Assured Enterprise of the Year. When we started two years ago, we gave it to Baijus at that point in uh, uh, time and so on and so forth. Because those Assured has all those elements which will ensure that you will have an assured success and it is very widely applicable. So I appeal to you and I appeal to all those who are going to get into research and innovation, please start using that matrix. In fact, there are uh, incubators now where some startups are using uh, T-shirts which say, are you sure you are assured today? The fact that you are assured yesterday does not mean that you will be today because the world is changing. Competition is changing. Regulations are changing and so on. Decentralized care delivery enabled by digital technology. I uh, will wrap up my lecture now. This is what is going to happen. Uh, what does it mean for uh, healthcare? All these technologies that are coming, they will improve access, quality care, better information, better patient outcomes. And actually reinventing healthcare in the digital world, the current practice is population-based, one of doctor's office, doctor order data, doctor's notes and unshared, information owned by doctors and hospitals, expensive, big ticket tick, data limited. Next practice will be from population based to individualized, real-time streaming, patient-generated data, our notes, patient-edited, information owned by rightful owner, uh, cheap chips, Moore's law. I mean, these are the major changes that are going to take place, and we have to take these into account. And finally, I would like to end by showing you uh, one of the problems in healthcare systems is, uh, for example, uh, this young man has lost his uh, uh, feet and he wears a $12,000 foot. Can we afford it? No. So we have to make it affordable. So therefore, this uh, Time magazine, for example, carried this story on $28 uh, Jaipur foot. I want to end with this. This is not the story of Jaipur foot. There's a principle that I want to sort of highlight for the new India of our dreams. Uh, so, Shil, if you can help put the uh, movie on. Yeah, you click on the, yeah, that's it. So this is a one minute movie, which is the most profound uh, as far as I'm concerned. You can see this fellow wearing the Jaipur foot. He climbs, look at the flexibility of his foot, and then he jumps, and you can see the strength, all right? So incredible uh, sort of foot in terms of material design and construction and so on and so forth. And just see what he does now. He runs. And read this. He can run a kilometer in four minutes, 30 seconds. Now is a question. How many of you can run one kilometer in four minutes, 30 seconds? Please put up your hands. One, two, three, four, five. 
nothing here, nothing here, nothing here. That's all? Come on. You're young guys. I can't, huh? I can tell you, look at my pot belly. Anybody else? No. Uh, Vidya, what is the capacity of this auditorium? Huh? 700. 700. Let's say we have 700 people here, out of which seven raise their hands. That means this fellow can beat 700 minus 7, 693 of you. <laughs> now think about it. Supposing you are not giving him the food at all, he would have crawled, taken several hours. Supposing you are giving him an ordinary wooden foot, taken several hours, you have given him something by which he can beat all of you almost. When I talk about affordable health care, when I talk about affordable excellence, this is excellence, by the way, not just affordable. This is the difference we can actually make. And the dream of creating an inclusive India, that is the kind of innovation that we actually uh, require. I would end up my talk by going back to my book, Reinventing India, where I have captured the J.R.D. Tata Corporate Leadership Award lecture that I gave in 1998. And I had said at that time, while ending the lecture, finally, 1999 should be the year where we should launch a powerful national innovation movement to propel us into the next millennium. The I in India should not stand for imitation and inhibition. It must stand for innovation. The I in IIT must stand for innovation. The I in industry, the I in CSR must stand for innovation. The I in every individual Indian must stand for innovation. And I had said, yeah. Yeah. and I had said, it is only this innovative India that will signal to the rest of the world that we are not a hesitant nation, unsure of our place in the new global order, but a confident one that is raring to go and be a leader in the community of nations. Thank you.